and you know we're here to discuss um they wait in the dark this is not the first film that you've had at fright fest how does it feel to be returning with yet another one i am excited um and i'm actually going to be there uh in about a week so I'm, I'm even more excited about that um you know obviously the first film i had there was enclosure which then was released in the united states under the title arbor demon but it was a great experience going in 2016 and then in 2020 uh, i am lisa was there but it was a virtual fest that year um so it's good to be back and um looking forward to uh seeing the film on the big, big screen i'm a little nervous i'm not gonna lie i'm a little nervous um but i think it's gonna go over well um so you know fingers crossed well you've got to be doing something right for the guys to keep picking your film so yeah i think so i think i definitely think that um for me like it when we get into fright fest it's almost like a confirmation that we we've done something right so I mean, how do you think that past screenings at Fright Fest have helped your films? Because I know a lot of, especially independent films and low-budget films, they rely on the, the festival circuit to get the, the word of mouth out there. It, I mean, I would say both times I've screened in the past, it's definitely got us on the radar of a lot of distributors. Um, it's funny because the second they announce the films that are going to be playing at Fright Fest, we normally get like six or seven uh inquiries from different distributors and so that that definitely helps because then it, it starts getting our, our movie on their radar and um helps with that with that and so um and you know just getting getting some interviews and and getting some reviews out there um as long as they're good reviews <laughs> but yeah no it, it's definitely been very very helpful and um it's good to get the reaction from the crowd too when when you see how the movie goes over. So um, I'm very thankful that I have gotten three movies in the festival over the over the, the course of my career. So, and Enclosure, I am Lisa, and your new film they they wait in the dark. They're very different to one another. Why is it important for you to explore different stories and different styles? Uh, yeah, I don't like necessarily repeating myself. Um, yeah, and I think it was funny because I, I actually, um, I co-wrote Enclosure, but then I wrote um, They Wait in the Dark um, by myself during 2020. <laughs> I got a lot of writing done during 2020, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make a haunted house movie, but I didn't want to do the same old, same old. Because um, I feel like everything, like a, a lot of haunted house movies have been like done over and over again. And the challenge, I, I wanted to create something different with it. So I, I kind of combined a domestic thriller with um, a haunted house movie. And so um, one thing that I try to keep consistent with those, with, with all three movies, the, the similarity is that they have female protagonists and that's very important for me to keep that going. Um, I enjoy that. I think it's more interesting and compelling. Um, so if I was to say there were some similarities, that's the one thing that kind of connects the movies but yeah, they're very thematically different. And, um, and it's funny, in some cases, their budgets are completely different. So um, I've worked with very small budgets. Um, Enclosure, which was actually shot in South Carolina. It's like the one movie. It's the one feature that I haven't shot in Kansas City because um, through various events, I was able to get financing through South Carolina. So that's where we shot the movie. Um, one thing that definitely connects the movies are, are my short schedules. So Enclosure was shot over 12 days, which is ridiculously short. And then I at least it was 14, which is probably the most challenging because that movie had the most locations. And then um, They Wait in the Dark. I wrote it specifically to be done in 12 days because I wanted to be able to get it in the can. And all the, obviously we were filming in the middle of COVID. So um, I, I made it so that we basically had four lead actors, maybe three locations. And I knew that I could do it with a smaller crew. Um, but yeah, I guess to answer your question, I don't like repeating myself. I like to change it up. Um, so then I'm, I, you know, the big question is what am I going to do next? So I'm always kind of thinking, okay, what, what kind of movie, what horror, what horror, uh, sub genre am I going to tackle next? And I guess it just depends because it's so hard raising financing for any film. So it kind of has to depend on where that's going to be. Like if, if somebody says, Hey, you know, if you want write me a movie that's going to be shot for a hundred thousand dollars. Obviously I'm not going to write a movie with a bunch of car chases. I have to, I have to kind of come up with an idea 
that is um, doable. And that was the thing with with uh, They Way in the Dark. The producer reached out to me and, and she was like, I need you to write something that we know we can get done in 12 days and is mostly location bound because, you know, COVID. And we were luckily we were luckily luckily we were able to shoot the movie. Uh, it was June of 2021 when we filmed the movie. And we shot it actually outside of Topeka, Kansas, which is about an hour or 15 from from uh, Kansas City. Um, and luckily, we were in that spot where everybody was pretty much vaccinated and the Delta sub variant hadn't come out yet. So we were about a month away from that. So we were able to get the movie shot in that that gap. And we, so we were very fortunate that that happened because it made things a little smoother um, in terms of production and stuff like that. But, yeah, I you know. I've, I've got a tangents for you, but yeah, that's basically, I, I like to do something a little different with each one and um, tell a different story. Um, I haven't made a sequel to any of my previous movies so far. Um, I'm not saying I won't do that at some point, but um, again, it all comes down to raising the money and trying to make sure that, um, you know, whatever budget I have, I, I write something that can be done in that, in that restricted budget. And as you say, you were making this during the the pandemic. I'm sure there was a lot of a lot of pitfalls and challenges. But what do you think that maybe some of the benefits of of working in in that way were? Uh, you know, it was a very intimate shoot. So basically, everybody's known each other for years. I've worked with Sarah McGuire for years on various projects. I actually wrote the script for her, so it was it was beneficial in the sense that I knew that she was going to nail it because I I wrote the, the the character for her. Um. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like there was a ton of people that we had to kind of manage. I mean, it was a very small crew, um, and then, so in that regard, it was kind of a it was it was kind of a, I wouldn't say relaxing because movie making is never relaxing, but certainly it was it was um, very efficient because um, we just didn't have a ton of locations. Like obviously, you know, we had the diner, we had we had several locations outside of the main house. But I mean, it was one of those things where I contacted several places and they were like, we don't want to have a film shoot here right now because of the pandemic. So we were very lucky um, to get the house location because it had been basically uh, untouched for a long time. It was it was a friend of mine. She owned the house and she's like, look, this house, it's my parents house. And it hasn't been used in, or really nobody's been in it for like 10 years. So everything in there is just covered in dust and, and cobwebs and stuff. So um, we locked out because I was like, well, we don't have to do a lot of, we don't have to do a lot of art direction on this house. I was like, you know, everything looked like it does in the movie. Um, in fact, we had to take things away because at some point I was like, okay, we have to at least make this place safe <laughs> for the crew to, to shoot here. So, um, but yeah, that was a great thing because it was, that's finding a house location for a movie is very, very difficult because you run into situations where, I mean, if there's people living there, you're like, hey, can I use your house for nine days? And are you OK with that? We're basically taking over your your living space. Um, and so we were lucky where there was nobody living in this house. The only challenge was she was renovating it as we were filming. So like she'd be like, OK, well, they're putting in new cabinets in the kitchen tomorrow. And so I'm like, all right, well, we got to make sure we get the kitchen scene shot before that otherwise we're going to come back and the kitchen's going to look completely different and it did like it basically like we would show up we were doing overnights which were probably i mean those are those are difficult shoots just because everybody's schedules are flipped but um she had construction guys in the house from like 9 a.m to 5 p.m and then we would show up at 5 p.m and film till 5 a.m and so we were kind of dancing around whatever they were be renovating at the time but it worked out. I mean, it was it was very smooth and um, the crew had a great time. I mean, we have a lot of fun uh, filming, even though we're making something very tense. You know, a lot of people think, well, it must have been a really tense shoot. I'm like, eh. the second we all cut, everybody's making jokes. And so it, it, it's it's a jovial time because everybody knows each other. It's kind of like a big family. But then on top of, you know, the pandemic and, you know, renovations, you also then have one of your key members of cast is you know, the child actor. You know, how yeah. did you work around his schedule? Because I know they're obviously only allowed to work certain times and certain hours and whatnot. Yeah, he was great. I was worried about it at first because I was like, I had made a, a family film years ago with kids and a dog, which they always tell you, don't ever do that. <laughs> and so um, and that actually worked out really well, too. But 
but yeah, you have a specific amount of time with the kid. And plus it's just, it's just one of those things where at some point the kid's going to run out of energy. However, with this, with, with, with Patrick, it was funny because we were all tired and he just kept going. So he was drinking Coca-Cola the whole time and basically running circles around us while we were like, Hey, it's three in the morning and I'm tired. I want to go to bed, but we have like 10 more shots to get. And so whenever I would say, hey, all right, Patrick, you're up, he would get he would get right into it. Um, so I didn't have any problems with him at all. It was great. Um, everybody, like I said, the cast was was fantastic to work with. And I mean, for me, so much of it is contingent on getting the right cast members in the movie, because I mean, ultimately, because you have a 12 day schedule, you don't want to have to continuously do more takes. You run out of time. So. Um, so, yeah, Patrick came in and, and kind of blow, blew us away. Um, and obviously the most stressful day of shooting was when he had to do the target practice. Everybody was nervous on that day. Um, and so we were very careful on how we handled that scene. So. And the story is, you know, it's, it's very, it's a very intimate story that's sort of looking at abuse and, and trauma and how right. things from the past impact, impact on our own, um, our own presence you know right. what was it about that sort of those themes that excited you and made you want to explore them for the film you know I wanted to write something where it was about the ending the cycle of abuse like there's as you watch the film there are, there are obviously various abusive relationships that are are exposed throughout the story and I wanted to tell a story where that ends with a specific character like that. Those cycles of abuse will end by the end of the movie. So that was the theme that I had running through my head as I was writing basically what is a thriller slash ghost story. Cause I feel like the best movies have are about something else, you know? And so that was kind of the idea. I don't know if I was, I had CNN on the whole time I was writing the script. So I don't know. I've, all these news stories were seeping into my head as I was writing it. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things where I would write 10 pages and then I would send it to Sarah a, and get her opinion and get feedback from her. I would then send send some pages to Megan, get some feedback from her to make sure that we were handling everything in a very, um, you know, a, in a good way, you know, and, and, and respectful way. And so, um what the big the biggest challenge obviously was getting the casting right for the character of Judith because she's the primary villain in the film and so um i had written the story specifically for sarah but i had no one in mind for judith i had kind of this vague idea who i wanted for it and so um lori luckily came to mind i had known her for 15 years and never cast her in a movie and um she kept kind of messaging me every now and then she's like when are we going to work together and I'm like well I think that you know at some point the timing will be right and so uh along the way I was like well she kind of popped into our heads and she nailed the audition so um but yeah yeah I you know, obviously I feel like the best movies have like an underlining theme and so when I was creating the story I was like okay this is what this movie's really about is ending the the cycle of abuse however I mean it, it's a, still a ghost story and it's still a domestic thriller. I mean, you say it took you guys 15 years to work together, but you gave her a hell of an introduction. I mean, the introduction to Judith is just, yeah. considering yeah. the rest of the film up to that point has been quite quiet and somber. Suddenly there's this, this explosion as this character that bursts onto the screen. Right. And it was hilarious that we shot that in a gas station in Leavenworth, Kansas, where the Leavenworth prison is, the famous prison. And it was funny because, I couldn't close that gas station, obviously, because I would have to have paid thousands of dollars to the gas station to close it. So we were working in like a, we were filming in a working gas station. So I'm like, oh, uh, somebody's coming in. A customer's coming in. All right, let's stop. And then I, I had my own actor playing the guy at the counter. So I'd be like, all right, real guy at the counter. Can you step out for a second? All right, let's put the, the actor in. And so it was chaos. I mean, we spent we basically had to dedicate one solid day to the gas station because I was like, there's no way we were going to be able to um, do more scenes on that particular day just because I knew that we were going to have to be doing start stopping and starting. And obviously I was like, can you turn the radio off inside the gas station? Because I couldn't have songs playing in the background. Um, but what was really funny was that the scene on the outside of the gas station where she confronts the, uh, the hecklers, um, 
I don't know, word got out in town that we were filming a movie. So everybody started pulling in to the gas station and like filming us from the pumps, which I thought was fine until I had to get a film on a, a, a shot on Lori. And every time I would do a take, a different car would pull in behind, like in the background behind her. So I'm like, well, continuity is going to be an issue here because if I cut to a different take, there's going to be a different car behind her. So finally, I had to tell the person who was in that pump, I said, just stay, don't move, don't don't leave until we get this shot so that I have one consistent car <laughs> behind her the whole time. So those are the things that you kind of you kind of run into uh, when you're filming on a location that you really you really can't control. I mean, I knew that the gas station was going to be chaotic, but luckily they were super cool about it. And um, worked with us. They've had film. They've had commercials filmed at that at that gas station in the past, so they kind of knew what w it was going to entail. Well, the hard work definitely pays off because, like I say, it's a church. It's a great scene and a great way to introduce a character. Yes, definitely. I thought it was. I thought it was a lot of. That was a lot of fun. Um. Yeah, you know, we're discussing we're discussing the the project in the lead up to uh, to its Bright Fest debut. And Bright Fest is a festival that celebrates everything that falls under the umbrella of the dark heart of cinema. For you yourself as a, as a film goer, what, what films that fall under that excite you? Oh, you know, I like every subgenre of horror. It's funny because like, actually my favorite subgenre of horror is, is the slasher movie, but I've never made a slasher movie because I can never come up with a concept that excites me. I'm always like, every, it's another thing where everything has been done. But mm. um but I like everything. So I'm kind of excited to see, I've got tickets to several films that I'm going to see while we're, while we're there. And um, it's definitely a, a different, it's a collection of different types of horror movies. Um, you know, I like horror comedy a lot. I actually would really like to make a, a horror comedy at some point. Cause I've made all these movies that are so there. I mean, there's some, there's, there's, um, comedy enters first not so much in they wait in the dark i feel like they wait in the dark is probably my, my, my least comedic uh, there's, there's no comedic moments in the movie other than maybe some charming moments with with patrick but uh generally speaking like i love every horror type of horror movie um but yeah i definitely i lean towards the slasher genre and i'm not really sure why that is maybe it's because as a kid those were the movies i was told not to watch and i watched them anyway like friday the 13th and nightmare on elm street so, um, so yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm excited to just sit down and, and take it all in. Um, there's just a lot to choose from. Yeah, definitely. And I get the, the sort of like the forbidden fruit. I was, um, I was never allowed to watch Hellraiser because it's the only horror film that's terrifying as I could. I sought it out and now it's probably one of my favorite horror films. I sort of go back and watch it time and time again. Yeah. And I think yeah. Again, itself with flashes, it probably stems from that, like it was the thing you weren't allowed near exactly exactly i mean that's the thing like i think late night cable um was like my best friend when i was a kid because or i you know i had i you know i was a kid in the 80s and so i had my own tv and so my parents would be like if they were downstairs and i knew like there was a friday the 13th movie on cinemax or something i would flip it to that and then i would wait to hear their footsteps coming up the stairs and i'd flip it back to like nickelodeon or something um, so that's kind of how it all started. Like if they had, maybe if they said they were okay with me watching horror movies, they were okay with it by the early nineties, by the early nineties, I was coming home with stacks of VHS tapes from the video store of like all the nightmare on Elm street movies and Friday the 13th and stuff. Um, but in the eighties, it was kind of a forbidden fruit. And I think that's what got me excited about it. And I think about, you know, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, and I remember going to the grocery store and Fangoria magazine was like on the shelf. And I would like if my parents were off shopping in a different part of the store, I would reach up and grab the magazine and start reading it. And I was probably eight or nine years old at the time. So, um, so I think that's kind of how it all got started. And with, you know, the Fright Fest screening, you know, about to, about to happen in just over a week, why should the uh, Fright Fest family take a chance on your film? I think the movie, I, I, I think that Fright Fest uh, is good about taking chances with indie films that are made with, I mean, it, it's funny because I, when I look at the lineup, all there's all these different budget ranges and our movies definitely falls into the micro budget range. But I think they're good. They're really good about celebrating 
you know, new voices, new, new talent. And I think that this movie definitely has some things to say. Um, it's not like, a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a straightforward horror movie. It's not all about blood and guts. So I think that they're definitely great about celebrating different types of horror movies. And um, they, they always find a little something for everyone, which I think is cool. And um, I think, I, again, I think this movie's got some things to say that I think will will make people think afterwards. At least that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> so I'm hoping that there's there's some discussion afterwards. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I think that's probably why they, they, they've taken a chance with the film. And um, and I appreciate it because, again, like these movies, we make these movies for next to nothing. And we really we, you know, we work so hard on them. So it's a very it's a reward to us to get it out there and seen at Fright Fest. And have you started working on your offering for Fright Fest 2023, 2024? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm, I'm raising, trying to raise funds for multiple projects. It's one of those things where it's like, I have to kind of like have multiple, multiple projects I'm thinking about doing because I think if I, the chances are that one of them will happen. So mm -hmm. I have maybe three or four that I'm trying to kind of plan out. Um, and again, a lot of it depends on I want this movie to make its money back. And so if it makes its money back, that means that, you know, my investor will then probably want to make another movie. So it's very important as a filmmaker to recoup your money for your investor, because then they'll go want, they'll say, well, let's make the next one. Let's let's discuss what the next one's going to be. So. Um, so, yeah, I, it's funny because I've got a couple of different movies. I want to do a vampire movie really, really bad. I've been like I. I get sick of thinking about it because I've always I've got a fun idea that I want to do um, that I think I could do in Kansas City. And uh, but it's a little bit more um, complicated. So it might not be something that I can do just with a micro budget. So I'm actually going to have to raise a decent sized budget for it. So um, so really, it just all depends on when the money is in the bank, you know, because it usually like, for instance, this movie I shot in 2021 and I was able to get it finished for this festival so i figure if i shoot one next year it probably will be ready for, for 2024 so it seems like every other year i've got something ready to go so well i wish you the uh, best of luck with the screening at fright fest thank you so much i appreciate it